Aloha, everybody. Aloha, Happy Palm Sunday. Happy Palm Sunday to you. What a great celebration it is. And being outside here in the beautiful weather kind of takes us back to that, which we will study out of Luke 19. So if you have your Bibles, find Luke 19 and let's pray and commit this great celebration day to the Lord. Father, thank you as we gather for your word, which will teach us. It's called the living word. So Holy Spirit, you will be alive in the teaching process as you deliver it to us. We will be made alive spiritually as we grow from it. I pray for application to take place, for blessing to take place, for any distractions that we might've brought here or that would rob our joy and our time from you that you would remove that and instead replace your presence so we give this time to you in jesus name amen amen we are in luke chapter 19 jesus had just completed a teaching on actually investing and he challenged people on how they invest their time and their resources and how it is a waste if you live for self and only invest in the temporary. But God has given us all different resources and we can be blessed in how we use them. And so here in this chapter, as it continues, verse 28 is where we will drop in. The plans that God certainly have laid out become visible. And it's very interesting always as you're watching Jesus' ministry to watch the divine work with the humanity or the natural man and Jesus doesn't give up any of his divine nature as he ministered on this earth he never gave up any of it but he certainly limited it as it in fact he could have done anything he wanted miraculously any times and many times he did but he would work in the realm of humanity and although this could be arranged spiritually or miraculously Many believe that Jesus just made the arrangements that we're about to read. So let's just dive in there. When he had said this, the teaching on investing, when he had said this, he went on ahead and he was going to Jerusalem. He had been to Jerusalem many different times, but now Jesus was going to Jerusalem to fulfill a mission, the very mission he came to this earth Four. And so as Jesus now this time goes to Jerusalem, it would be his last journey to Jerusalem. It would be the mission complete journey. And he knows all this in both his divine nature and his human nature, but still he makes the arrangements. So he went on ahead going to Jerusalem. Verse 29 says, and it called Olivet, or we know it as the Mount of Olives, that he sent two disciples, two of his disciples. And as he, um, I'm sorry, I skipped a verse here. It came to pass when he drew near Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. He sent these two disciples and he told them this instruction. Go into the village opposite you. And whereas you enter, you will find a colt tied, not uncommon, You'll find this colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Uncommon. Well, not uncommon that there are colts like that, but this would be in the specific place where Jesus told them to look. So you go there, you'll find a colt, and it's one that has never been written. Nobody's ever sat on this colt. So here is the instruction. You loose it, untie it, and you bring it here. Go into the village, find the specific colt no one's ever rid on written on and you bring it here loose it and bring it here verse 31 and if anyone should ask you why are you untying this colt then you should respond this way because the lord has need of it because the lord has need of it that always stops me when i get to that part of this passage the lord has need of it really does God have need of anything? Well, not in the sense that we often think of need, but he is allowing humanity to interact with prophecy and with the divine 
and he will use common tools and obedient men and women to fulfill this prophecy. So if you're interrupted as you're untying this donkey, this colt, then all you need to say is the Lord has need of it. And that term wasn't a password, uh, you know, to, to kick things in gear. By the way, I got up at two this morning and I looked at my phone and it said, uh, download complete. So it was doing one of those automatic downloads. Then it's, I, I just wanted to know what time it was. And of course it was all going through that, you know, voodoo stuff. And so I, I uh, looked again, I clicked it once and it said, enter your password. And I said, I, I can't enter my password when I'm fully awake. I have no idea where it is or where I hit it or how many times I've changed it. And so I let it go till this morning. Finally, I found my password and opened it up. I thought I would miss church, miss videotaping and miss everything altogether. Passwords are important. This is not a password. This is Jesus speaking with authority. And this is the line you will say. It's not a get out of jail free card. It's not a password. It's a line of authority that God has it taken care of. If anyone asks you, why are you untying this cult? You say, because the Lord has need of it. The Lord has need of it. And so verse 32 continues the story. So those who were sent, the disciples, they went their way and they found it just as he said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it, now this is the owner of the animal, comes out and he says to them, why are you untying the colt? He didn't know them. Why are you untying the colt? And they said to them or to the owner, the Lord has need of him. It, they, they followed in obedience exactly what Jesus told them to say. And by living in obedience, doing what Jesus said, the result was, you're good. You're good to go. The Lord has need of it. And then they brought him to Jesus. So notice the, the instructions, detailed, not overly complicated. The response, obedience, the interaction, they did just what Jesus told them, regardless of what the outcome would be. They did what Jesus told them to do. And as a result, they were able to bring the colt right to Jesus. And they brought it to him and they threw their own clothes on the colt. In Luke's gospel, <coughs> Dr. Luke records that the, the disciples started that process. They took their outer cloak and put it like a saddle or a cushion, as it were, over this colt. And that was their response. Jesus is going to ride this animal. Let's put our own clothes on the colt. And they set Jesus on him. So now you see the picture. The animal's been retrieved. The saddle of sorts of some comfort is in its place. And they help Jesus mount this animal. And as Jesus is on, he went. And verse 36 says, as he went, many others, other people, not just his disciples now, but interested parties, a multitude begins to form. So not just believers, but people start getting caught up in watching this and they participate. And it says, many spread their clothes on the road. So now not only do you have a saddle of comfort and honor, it's an honorable thing to do to put your clothes on an animal so the rider can enjoy it better. But now they've made a, in essence, a red carpet. They made a smooth path. As, as the animal's coming, they throw down their garments and make a smooth pathway descending from all of it into Jerusalem. And so you see the picture, many are spreading their clothes on the road. Verse 37 tells us then as Jesus was drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude, so it's gone from just his disciples to some other people throwing clothes on the road. But now as he's drawing near the descent, as he's coming down in, the whole multitudes of the disciples, the followers, and a greater crowd being drawn, the whole multitude of these disciples begin to break into a rejoicing or a praise song. And they begin singing and shouting and proclaiming. This started with, if anyone tells you 
hey, what are you doing when you untie this animal? You say the Lord has need of it. And now that authority has come down and it's moved across the crowd. And as he is drawing near, the whole multitude began to rejoice and praise God. Rejoice. There's great reason for joy. And praising God because that's exactly what we're called to do. God was in the midst. God, the God son, Jesus was on this prophesied animal prophesied from Zechariah and other places as well and it's all starting to happen some most not even knowing the prophecy and connecting the dots but they're certainly caught up in what's taking place and so as Jesus is descending and the clothes are thrown on the ground and the palm branches begin to spread this joyful sound begins to penetrate the crowd and it's called praises and I want you to notice as the story continues, the account continues, that as those praises get louder and louder and more involved and more people enter in, it disturbs the enemy greatly. And can I suggest to you that that's still the case today? The devil himself, enemies of God, they don't like praise music. They don't like Jesus' name above all names being lifted up. They hate this word, Hosanna, save now. They, they hate the music. They hate the dance. They hate the honor. The palm branch is going down. It was very disturbing to the local enemies of God that day, as you'll see. But it still is. And all I'm suggesting about that in your personal time, or when we have our corporate times like we just did, Praise is a powerful tool, not just to stick it to the devil. I mean, you can do that now and then. But to say, hey, my eyes are truly turned upon Jesus. Yes, I have difficulties in this life. Yes, there are struggles. But I'm focused on Jesus. Charles Spurgeon speaks to this passage and he says, no doubt in that crowd, <coughs> somebody's wife was sick. Somebody had some financial problems. Somebody had some other issues, but they still praised God. It's not a fake kind of praise, but it's this is my Jesus. I'm following him. I'm honoring him. And nothing is more important than that. Even my struggle, my pain. It doesn't mean that God's not concerned with your pain or struggle. But praise has a powerful impact on you and your outlook, but also on the enemy. Let's see what takes place. You saw the, des the descending Jesus now on the donkey. You hear the music playing, at least the song singing, rejoice and praise God with a loud voice. They were very clear. There was no reason to be shy. A loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. They were praising Jesus for what he had done. He'd healed the blind. He'd raised the dead. He was a powerful figure, but they were looking only for a political figure. I mean, thank you for doing that. Thank you for the wonderful meals. Thank you for feeding the multitude. But what we really want you to do is save us from Rome. And so all of this singing and all this praise to God, Jesus is allowing it. As he prophesied, as it was prophesied would happen. But many of the voices who were singing go, yeah, we like him. Yeah, praises, praises, honor this king. Won't you be our... Caesar, but not in the Roman sense. Won't you be our leader, our political leader? That's what they were after. Well, here we go as the passage moves. It says, as the loud voices are singing, they said, blessed is the king. These are their words. They wanted a political king, but blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. King means authority, but this is a different kind of authority. Blessed be the king who comes in the name of the Lord. That's a different kind of king. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. All the authority, the highest authority that you could have. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So there's mixed praise going here. Praises for God himself, but also a desire and a wish for a political leader. And verse 39 is the reaction of those enemies of God. Some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd. They're in the crowd, by the way. 
as all this is going on, as the parade is moving down, the Pharisees are in that crowd. They're not singing. And they actually yell from the crowd, Hey, you, Jesus, teacher, you tell these people to shut up. It's in essence what they say. Some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Stop them. They're, in their mind, they're praising a man. They're praising a man on a donkey riding in Jerusalem. And that would be blasphemy if he wasn't God. But he was the king. And he was the king appointed from on high. And they hated this song. They hated the spectacle. They hated the fact that the people that they controlled were turning, however sincere or insincere, were turning to Jesus and calling him king. Hey, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Do you recount with me the many times throughout the gospel when the Pharisees would take on Jesus and sometimes he wouldn't even respond? He wouldn't even give them a word. Or... He certainly, and other times, wouldn't allow this kind of praise. Typically, Jesus would heal someone and say, go and tell, no, and tell nobody. Go and don't tell anyone what God has done for you. The time was not right. But now, prophetically, the time is right. Daniel's account tells us to the day the time was right. 438 years from his prophecy to the day the time was right. And Jesus said, let him praise and I will be in that position. And basically he said, bring it on. But the Pharisees do not like it. Rebuke your disciples. This time Jesus answered them in verse 40. And watch how the passage ends here. In verse 40, Jesus answers them simply, but he answered and said to them, I tell you, Jesus on the donkey, looking into the crowd to the Pharisees that just said, tell them to shut up, rebuke them. Jesus looks to them and says, I tell you that if these should keep quiet or silent, that was their desire. If they are silent, the stones would immediately cry out. The Lord of all creation turns to the Pharisees and say, if the people stop praising, the stones will start praising. You simply need to go to the book of Psalm. We won't do it this morning, but Psalm 96 and Psalm 148 you'll see the trees praising God and the oceans praising God and the mountains praising God and the animals praising God if these people silence then creation itself will cry out it cannot be contained the praise of God really the question for us is do we want to participate in it I uh, had the girls down on the boat this week and my granddaughters and um, it was a beautiful week as you know but uh i told we, we inflated the inflatable and and i told them i can take you to a little mystery hidden island grandpa's going to take you to the island so i put the big battery i have a little trolling motor for that inflatable and we came out of the channel and i went down by the research center you know that end of the harbor and the tide and i knew the tide was really low and uh no one was out there this was friday no one was out there and uh, that whole beach was exposed. I figured it would be because the tide was so low. So I have a little secret mystery island, girls, and and uh, that's the stuff grandpa does to trick their little granddaughters. And so I beached the, the inflatable up there, and we spent a little while there, mommy and I, playing on that beach and playing tag, and, and then we jumped back in the boat and came back, and I'd spent the night on the boat the night before, and that was one of our windy nights and we got a little rain. And uh, I, I love that experience of sleeping on the boat when it's a little windy and rain's coming. Um, I usually have a roll of duct tape to tat the leaks. And uh, um, apparently I waited too long because when I stepped on the carpet, I got a little and I had to pump the bulge pump out and uh, it's an old boat. But uh, I love in the middle of the night watching out the window, the sailboats do this and the clanging of all the rigging and it's almost like a praise song. It's almost as if the wind and the rain and the ocean is just kind of gently singing their praise to God. If we silence our praise, if these people had silent their praise, creation is able itself to cry out and to praise God. And that's what Jesus told them. 
that wraps up, verse 40 wraps up with that statement, the triumphal entry. But sometime shortly after that, the final few verses tell us that Jesus took the time to do this. Listen to this as we close. As he drew near, he saw the city, Jerusalem. Remember the very name, Jerusalem is city of peace. He saw the city and he wept over it. This is his final mission week. And he had come and he had taught and he'd taken on the Pharisees and he had healed and he proclaimed the Father and he taught about heaven. And now he looks over the city and he weeps. The word actually means wailed. Wailed out of frustration is a good original. He wails over the frustration of the rejection of Jerusalem. And he's looking over the city and he says, if you, Jerusalem, had known, even you, especially in this, your day, this Palm Sunday, it was your day. It was a prophesied day of Daniel. And if you know, especially your day, the thing that make for your peace, city of peace that doesn't have peace. If you knew that this was your day and all that would make your peace, you could have been saved. But now they are hidden from your eyes. And watch the prophecy Jesus closes with here. Now the things that would show you peace, they're hidden from your eyes. Jerusalem, Israel is blinded because of their rejection. For the days will come upon you when your enemy will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you off in every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another. And listen to the reason why that won't happen, why not even one stone would be left upon another. You will not leave one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. It had been prophesied. God sent his only son to proclaim it. And you missed your day. You missed that special time of your visitation because of hardened hearts and sin that you let in. Jesus is predicting and prophesying five specifics about the Roman occupation and takeover. There would be a building of an embankment around Jerusalem, which happened shortly after. The surrounding of the city, they would lay siege. The destruction of the city would be the third thing. The killing of the city's inhabitants, Rome would do. And the complete leveling of the city where not even one stone would be left unturned. Jesus is weeping because he said, you could have had salvation. You could have had your Messiah, but you rejected him. You have missed and you did not know the time of your visitation. It's a sad statement for Jerusalem. God is still very gracious and he loves Jerusalem and he is reaching out continually. But there was a sad miss. Can I make an, an application from Hebrew to Gentile real quick in closing? It is very easy for us to miss the day of our visitation with Jesus. His grace and mercy, his word is still taught and we can read it ourselves. We can hear it through a variety of sources. We can come to church and hear it preached, but we can still miss it if we're not taking care of our hearts. If our hearts become hard, if they become pharisaical or legalistic, we can miss the day of our visitation. But as we reflect on Palm Sunday today, the great message is victory and praise and Jesus still saves. Even if you messed up your time of visitation and you've missed it many times, Jesus is saying today is the day of salvation. Restore your life with me now. Come to me now. Praise me now. Let's be one now. And that comes simply with making our hearts right with God. Jesus did the work. We get the decision. And I want us to close in prayer this morning with giving you that opportunity and that decision of anything that would block you from your relationship. God, if you've never invited Christ in your heart, do that today by simply saying, Father, forgive me of my sins. I accept the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Come into my heart, forgive me, make me new, and make me not miss this visitation, but take full advantage of it. 
or any repair you need to do, anything in your heart, some harsh words, something that you need to ask God for forgiveness for. As we close, let's do our business with God. And Lord Jesus, as we bow before you, on a warm Sunday morning, we ask that the warmth of your spirit would come upon us. If there's sin that we need to confess or a relationship we need to make right with you, we would ask that you would lead us through that. For those who need to receive you for the first time, that simple prayer, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I surrender to you, Savior. I receive your forgiveness. I become new in you. And Jesus, we ask as a church congregation, visit us regularly because of our soft hearts. Visit us. We know you live in us, but visit us with that work of the Holy Spirit and the refreshment of the word and the encouragement from brothers and sisters just as we keep our hearts open to you. And as we reflect and as we think of you on this Palm Sunday, we want to make sure that you know that we are open to do what you would call us to do. Just as the disciples untied that animal, you speak and you tell us what the Lord has need of for us. Let's close with this little invitation to the Lord to do his work. Speak, my Lord. Speak, my Lord. Speak, and I'll be quick to answer thee. Speak, my Lord. Speak, my Lord. Speak, and I'll be Speak to us, Lord, and find within us quick hearts, open hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.